I hope it's been arranged to annoy you or stimulate you enough to wake you up, and I hope you're going to school to join in. And I say you, I mean all of you. So I wouldn't want the students here to think that they have to sit back while the professionals in the audience make statements saying how good they are. The best questions, the best questions come from the youngest contributors. The best questions are the apparently naive questions, and they're always the hardest to answer. So all please join in. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, come on, because, because somebody out there we've managed to annoy or stimulate, they must have chipped something in on ego and tall buildings and changing places. Hi, I'm with Dick Jeff. What is the impact of Mary Morton's ad on changing her approach to her tall buildings in London? I noticed that uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, getting a tall improvement in London. Impossible. The wharf was built dozens of very tall buildings. Now I know London is taking a very different approach to planning. It's probably true that the presence of Mary Wharf has meant that people in London are more favorably disposed to tall buildings, so that's not something. Canary Wharf is an alternative solution. But the, the press always likes to paint the picture that the city only changed because Canary Wharf came from. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Mary Wharf is an area of the Dockers of London, the, um, the area like the East Packing Yards were in, in Chicago, uh, the area of industrial dereliction, where there was an opportunity to create new jobs and new forms of development. But uh, an American called G. Ware Travels said, and I don't know what that's an anagram of, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what that's an anagram of, but he, he was on a retainer from Credit Suisse First Boston, who realized an agent of love for London, the one percent retailer. And he discovered there was this area in the east of London, in the Dockers, where there was no planning control and no property tax as a means of regenerating the area. So they went into this sort of disciplinary wolf project. The press said, of course, that then meant that the city changed and tried to keep up. In fact, what happened was these were two parallel approaches that followed financial deregulation in the late 1980s. And there are two very different models. An area is about building a million or a billion and a half square foot buildings, blocks, an American approach. It, 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 it was an American project, but it was a little bit Canadian, but we uh, could people saw the difference. The Olympia <laughs> 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 and York came, and they were going to London. They were going to build it a different way, a North American way. The problem is that that's assuming that corporations are going to carry on working in the same way. These big banks were going to walk over the half square feet in one building. But as I keep telling people, Canary Wharf is the first stop on the way to Bangalore and Shanghai. These jobs that have moved east in the city are the process jobs, the back office jobs, and they won't stop that. They'll keep moving east. The problem then becomes what do you do in Canary Wharf? Because it's not in the centre of London. You can't get 90% um, of the employees to Canary Wharf by public transport. It isn't feasible for the edge of the city. So what we're trying to do in the city is to make the city as unlike Canary Wharf as possible. We're trying to make it more like the West End of it combined with the business district. So good quality hotels, good quality shopping, good quality club, best piece set. All of that <laughs> in this area where people will come to work. You both are, uh, sorry, you both are uh, in charge of uh, cities that have a very long history and have developed. I don't know if the word or is necessarily correct, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on a city like Dubai that has uh, grown very quickly over the period of only a few decades, and uh, what your insights on uh, the way that they're doing. Well, I've never been to Dubai, it is, uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around it in terms of the speed at which it's developed and the scale at which it's developed. I was there a few months ago, and I it is unbelievable how fast it is going. And I do have a bit of concern about uh, that kind of development where 20 years from now, 25, 30 years from now, it's very hard to predict what its impact would be versus uh, London, Chicago, San Francisco, where you are actually building on a layer of history, except London. Here. Uh, the idea is sustainable, but spending for as the fall buildings, which is 
still uncharted territory in terms of how it transforms or whether it transforms a place. It's questionable. In Chicago, it works best because you already have other types of buildings and other scales as well as the tall. A lot of the experiments that were done here, one diagram that I showed where you Alvarasa, you start with and build all these object buildings, they never work. So, Dubai, you know, it's phenomenal in terms of the way that place is going now. I, I'm not sure if it's very useful now, which would be just sick. That's it. And I'm sorry to add to that, is because the cultural dimension is extremely important. Uh, the strong factor in London is we discovered basically that there are over 200 languages being spoken children in schools in London every day. Uh, that is an, an amazing potential, that's an amazing strength, that cultural melting pot. Because that's how you get new ideas. People with different cultural backgrounds merging their thought processes together. And it's no surprise that the Ford Motor Company have moved their international design headquarters, their world's headquarters, to Soho in London. The centre of the West End, the, um, the nightlife and um, media quarter of London, because it's a very creative place. They could do that anywhere on earth, provided they have that human input. <coughs> so, whatever you're planning, whether it's in the Far East, in the Middle East, in North America, in Europe, you need the cultural richness and diversity to fuel the generator that we are calling these financial centres. Um, it, it's it's <coughs> one of the things that do it, as I was saying in Chicago, I mean, I don't have to tell you how strong a, a social generator uh, and cultural um, mixing of uh, Chicago is, and it's exactly the same in London, and that is the strength of our two cities. Just to add to that, there was a recent study done by CEO of Sportset in that part of the that was when he did a lot of studies about cities. A college educated 25 to 35 year olds. I think 60 years, 65% of them <coughs> choose where they can do it and then look for work. That has a huge implication in, in a creative seat for competitive uh, age that by a lot of places would have London, where you already have a, a creative culture and quality of life that attracts the future generation. Sorry, can I just explain? We have one microphone down. So if anyone feels that they have a big enough mouth, they don't need a microphone, they can ask a question from the back. Please stand up and do that. We have a question here at the front. Thank you. Uh, I, I came here uh, basically as a structural engineer to learn about the, the unique buildings that are going forward. Uh, I'm also a member of the New York City Planning Commission at former First City. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I'm intrigued by your comment, particularly Commissioner uh, Safa. Uh, my question, with all the development that you are doing here in downtown, are you doing anything with respect to affordable housing? I notice all of these buildings, they appear to be based on the grid. And tying in with the other, with the other comments regarding culture and, and, and uh, mixture, what, if anything, are you doing with respect to housing, schooling for the uh, school facilities, rather, for the, uh, the apartment buildings that are going up? I assume your infrastructure can handle the situation as you described. Yes, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges uh, because of some successes like Chicago, Vancouver, even New York, San Francisco. Affordability is a critical component of any sustainable state. We are not hit as bad as <coughs> comparatively in San Francisco and New York because there is a large amount of housing stock. But we're doing a number of uh, different types of programs to address that issue. We don't have an inclusionary housing requirement, but we put in a, a density bonus, for example, in the downtown area where we incentivize developers with density to create affordable housing. Just in the short time, it's been in place less than two years, I think it's over $20 million already collected. Just that we got the mayor announced a new uh, policy where we, any developments that we have a review authority, we would require if it's a development or if we come for any zoning change uh, or if we deal with new sales, which we control. 
we you fire out to 20% of uh, buildings to be affordable or we pay in the fee. Chicago has had very diverse areas throughout the city. And one of the difficulties of uh, creating across the board affordable requirements state is 20% development. We have areas that we want development and areas where actually the buildings or the housing stock that is built. It's already affordable, so we don't. So we are targeting our affordable housing policy. The Department of Housing, there are a number of different programs for rental as well as new ordinance that went into effect just less than a year ago, where we're uh, keeping affordability for the life of uh, any program that we assisted for affordability. It has to stay affordable for the life of the building. Thank you. They, I mean, that's another one, a father of a question, that, that's, that's a big question. It is very difficult. Part of the way we do this is through operation of, as we said, various types of tax, and one of which in London is planning game, where the granting of planning permission is dependent on payment of a levy, which is divided up for things like training in different communities and to, to connect them with the jobs that are going to be created. Uh, it's used for affordable housing, projects which are built immediately outside the business district in the, the inner urban fringe where we have uh, social problems like employment for housing so there's an input to that uh, there's an input into improving public transport out of that work as well as improving the immediate surroundings of the site development by enhancing the streetscape uh, and by providing community facilities for those who are not really affected by the development itself over and above that of course the ministers themselves have programs to um, constrain what the office can do, to prevent them, in other words, simply pushing up office development and to ensure there's the right amount of retail activity, that we do, don't have um, a nine to five economy, that we have an economy that can start early in the morning and go on late into the evening. A lot of this comes down to the right mixed use. Now mixed use, that's a buzz for us to use all right. It's a bit like greenwash, but it's <coughs> you know. Mixed use, everyone says, oh, that's wonderful, that's motherhood and apple pie, you know, we must have mixed use. But motherhood and apple pie can both make you feel sick in certain circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same thing, you've got to get the mixture right. There are areas where it's not appropriate to increase residential density or to bring more residents in. Because you are creating the equivalent of an industrial estate. The city of London is the equivalent of an industrial estate. It's a financial transaction, it's an industrial scale process. And the constant redevelopment of the science means it's not a very nice place to live. It's a great place to party, though. And if you can bring the partying and the living together and the retailing and the, all that that range of activities, then if people live perhaps you know, a few hundred yards, a few hundred meters away and have to walk to that district or come by public transport, that doesn't matter. They will come. It will be a destination. But I'll bring you back to that one word again. You've got to create a place. And provided you can put the P word onto what you've done, then I think it will have those things with it, that diversity, the accessibility. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like Disney did it. That's what you mean. Yeah. Sam, do you want to come in? Uh, well, just quickly, I mean, that's one of the challenges for for new development and in a market economy as well. Uh, in Chicago, 
very actively addressing one sort of the social diversity from uh, work the workforce perspective. We have under the new zoning ordinance, we've protected quite a large area of what's called man uh, manufacturing. One of the critical issues that we're losing the blue collar workers because of gay and other places. While we're protecting the land so it doesn't go, the cost doesn't go up as a residential pressure, we're also actively looking at policy to attract most of the 21st century workers that, that we can retain the unemployed to be employed in those 21st century jobs. The uh, downtown area, the loop, over the last six, seven years, actually almost 10 years, we've actively tried to address that issue where we have almost 60,000 students going to school within the loop, and quite a significant amount of them are living there. Through the planning department and what's called taxes and financing dollars, we are building or rehabbing or uh, uh, reusing existing buildings to house students. And it is critical to house students there 24 hours a use that they want. There are about almost 90,000 people living within a 12 uh, square mile area within the loop. I mentioned Millennium Park, and I encourage you especially in the summer or even the winter to go there and you really see the diversity of people that come there. And hopefully, we want some of those actually to live within the downtown area. Through cultural activities, we're trying to focus on how do we retain Chicago's homeless uh, as a city, a jazz city in the 20s. So we're working through a task force now. What are the incentives that we need to bring to bring the creative arts? part of the fabric of the downtown area uh, to address some of those diversities. It is a difficult issue. There are some success stories uh, that we are trying to address. Can you think we take one more question? Yes. Some of you are working with cities that are premier cities in the world. And you didn't have much to say positive about Frankfurt, but more cities in the world are closer to the situation than the dynamic nightlife of Chicago or London. What can those sort of mid-tier cities do with planning to try to develop that sense of place? Uh, I, I think mean, that's, a, that's a very important question. Oh, because, you, right? Well, <laughs> this is the problem you see. You're, you're, as you, you quite rightly say, most people in the world in cities that are not the same scale as London or Chicago or New York or um, major Chinese cities would have But in the other cities, there is a feeling that if they don't get on board the same train, the financial um, dealing trend, they're not going to succeed. But that's not how these cities developed historically. Each city had a different civilization. Each city, in, in Germany for instance, there, there was not one great city in Germany, there were a collection of great cities, principalities. And each of them had a different specialization. Each one was successful in a different thing. Each one had the same level of pride in something different. So they were equally strong. The problem now is that if a city isn't as big as London, it then says, oh well, we must try and get the back office from a place like London. We must have the call centers from a place like London. Now, this is not good forward thinking. These jobs won't, will not survive even in those places, because eventually the computer will also sort of fail. And I'm not joking. You know, when, you now ring up, when, when your Dell computer breaks and you end up in Bangalore with somebody else on the phone reading from the script, that's work that will eventually be completely computerized with most recognition. So it's very important for those communities and for those smaller cities to develop their own sense of pride around something that is unusual, something that is unique to them, rather than trying to just get a slice of this same one thing. And that's after all, one city in London became strong, the city of Chicago in a very different way became strong on very different things, uh, and developed its pride from that. And, you know, looking back into the history of Chicago, it might be shorter than London, it's wonderful to read it and see how this city developed its fight against opposition from other parts of the states. It proved itself, and by God has it proved itself. It doesn't matter what size you are, you can do that. If you've got to pitch it right, you've got to pitch it differently. Sam, do you want to add to that? Uh, I, I would encourage you to read a book, uh, Creative City, by Charles Landry's book, London. It's about how do we become, how do cities become cities of the world? rather than a world city. And what he talks about is the importance of uh, positioning yourself regardless of your scale. What is it about you that anyone from Bangalore or other places can come and feel comfortable? What are the 
critical elements to address those issues and understand those issues. So we have a city of the world, because the world is supposed to change, as you know. Uh, in Chicago, <coughs> 10 years ago, or 8 years ago, the mayor said, you know, China is a very dominant uh, economy. Uh, the kids that are in the public school, they get out of there. He said, they, they're not going to have a chance. At least they should at least understand the culture. So he said, I want public schools to have an Android education. It has a large education program in the city. They're not going to be fluent in it, but at least they have a, an understanding how to converse or at least understand the public. So those kinds of steps that we take early are important in positioning the city, city of the world. Charles Lambie. Uh, but the, the financial mechanism is going to be the one 
And the price of the dollar of oil is also going to have some, as well the price of the barrel of oil is also going to have some impact on it. Um, moving out of centres of cities is not very sustainable. People assume rural lifestyles are sustainable, they're not. It's the poor people in the city that pay the rich people to live in the city. So that was how to go to that point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sam and Peter. We appreciate it. And, uh...